God bless you. We're studying the periods of time as they have been on planet Earth. It's very necessary to understand these. Otherwise, we wouldn't, we wouldn't understand the Bible. The interpretation of the Bible largely depends upon you understanding how God has dealt with man from the beginning until now. That he progressively has reached out to help man, to bless man, to heal man, to save man. And uh, each of these dispensations, he was moving in closer to help him. And we begin, as if you look on the back of your uh, teaching syllabus here, we begin with the dispensation of innocence. And in this dispensation, it was from the creation to the fall of man. And we have no idea how long it may have lasted. Uh, no, no need of guessing at it. If God didn't give you the number, just wait till you get to heaven and talk to him about it. Uh, some, some have said, oh, Adam fell the same day. I don't believe stuff like that. I believe he and, he, he and Eve had a good time all over that garden, playing and romping and eating fruit and getting acquainted. And so uh, uh, I don't believe, I don't accept that. And then it says that God came down in the evening of the day and talked with him. We don't know how many years that went on either, you see. But we do know that he rebelled against that and left his state of innocence and became a convicted sinner because of his own deliberate actions. And then we came to a dispensation that we call the dispensation of conscience. And this takes us right down to the flood. And it's a whopper. We should have given more time to it because sin became exceedingly sinful during that period of time. They even created giants artificially, you know, created giants, creatures with heads like this, standing 10 foot tall, six fingers and this kind of thing. And so God had to reduce the time period of man's life on the earth because he was living about a thousand years and committing a lot of sin. And so God broke that dispensation and he moved into the third one, the dispensation of human government, in which he let man govern himself, you know, and uh, work with himself. And, and in and this dispensation of human government, it went to, from the time of the flood to the Tower of Babel. It so miserably failed, man did. God kept his covenant, but man did until God had to change it again. And this time, uh, he brings us into a beautiful moment of di the dispensation of the promise. And uh, we were dealing with that in our last lesson, and I'd like for us just to move right in there again and look, and, and, and look at it, where God made special commitments called covenants. And, and man responded to those. And as long as man did not break the covenant, the covenant continued. God, does not, he, God is not a covenant-breaking God. And, and so we, uh, uh, we, we have to come to know that and, uh, and uh, not break the covenants of God. It's very likely that every person in this room has a covenant with God. You, you promised God something and God promised you something and that becomes a covenant. Now God will not break his part, but if you break it, then God is not responsible for the results of it. We began uh, with the time of Abraham in, in, our, in our last study of how God began to work with Abraham, telling him to get out of his country and to go into a new country and there that he would bless him. And he says, I'll make you a great nation which he did, uh, and, and I'll, I'll bless them that bless you, and I'll curse them that curse you. And he says, uh, I will be with you, and so forth. And immediately, God and Abraham became covenant makers together. And uh, you say, what was the great covenant that God had with Abraham? Uh, it, it, it had to do with every male being circumcised. That's the covenant of Abraham. And that covenant in, a, in certain forms among the Jewish people is until this very day. 
You will not find a Jewish male on the face of the earth that hasn't been circumcised. I've never seen one. and I've been all over this world, and I have never known of a Jewish male who refused circumcision or his parents did not circumcise him. And you might wonder why God still blesses those people. It's because they have kept that covenant of circumcision. If they were to cease doing it on their own, God would have a new relationship with them. But they haven't. Doing all the time from Abraham until this, until this, until this time right now. But under this dispensation, evil things began to happen. You have the story of Sodom and Gomorrah that took place under promise. The man Lot was able to live under the promise, being a nephew to, to, to Abraham, as long as he, was, as he was with Abraham. But when he deliberately moved away from Abraham, he moved away from the source. I, I don't think we've gotten across in this country to people that there are certain places where there are sources of blessing. You can't go to just any church and be blessed. I mean, uh, if you think a thing like that, why don't you go to, the, uh, to a machine shop and buy a dress? You say, they don't have dresses there. Well, some churches don't have any blessing either. And you can go there all you want to and yell and scream all you want to, but it don't do any good because that anointing is not there. It has to begin in the pulpit. It cannot begin in the pew. We used to have people receive the Holy Spirit in certain denominations and say, I'm going to go back and change them. And I'd smile at them and say, it's amazing how strong you are. God can't do it and you think you're bigger than God. God has to do it from the top. He cannot do it from the bottom. You can go sneak one of them off and take them to one side and get them through to the Holy Spirit. Then you're both hated in that place. Who'd want to go to a place like that? I want to go to a place that are like-minded and like-hearted as I am. I don't want to go to the refrigerator with my fire burning. All you're going to do is burn up things, you see. And, and all you're going to do is somebody kick you out the back door saying, would you just get out of here? You caused this mess. It's better to work with those that work like you do, that love like you do, that preach like you do. And it's, it's the best way to live. But here, this, this young man, Lot, didn't understand that all of his blessing came from Abraham. You know, he had a faith. It was a leaning faith. He was, he, he was living off of Abraham's faith. And after he left Abraham, he, he didn't demonstrate faith anymore. He couldn't control his wife. His own daughters married homosexuals. And those that didn't marry homosexuals, I think they committed adultery with their own father and produced kids that were wild. They, they created people like the Moabites that forever fought Israel. And, and, and so they got clear out of the thing. Now, they were living under a dispensation called promise, you see. God promised to be with them, but they broke most of the laws, most of the relationships. Uh, he, they, they broke it. And so, in, in Genesis chapter 12 and verse 2, God says, and I'm going to make you a great nation. And uh, he has made Abraham a great nation. Uh, they're the only great people on the face of the earth that can tell you who the first one was. We don't know who the first American was. We don't know who the first German was. We don't know who the first Russian was. But everybody knows who the first Jew was. Isn't that something? And, and so there's a uniqueness there that you, you can't deny it. It's a truth, you see. And the thing to do is to accept, accept that truth and know that in that dispensation of promise, God was, God was faithful. And, and, God, and God blessed them. Then we come to Isaac. And uh, you, you read about him, especially in the Hebrews chapter 11, verse uh, 13. He is listed one of the, as one of the men of faith. And he lived under that promise, you see, uh, of his father Abraham. And oftentimes when you speak of God, they call him the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That, that, that he was their, their God in successive generations. Now that's interesting in that God has no grandchildren, you see. Uh, Isaac wasn't a grandchild to God. In every generation, God begins brand new again. Uh, your, your children are not the grandchildren of God, and, and they don't become Christians automatically because they're born at your house. They have to be born again on the inside in order to be the children of God. They're your children because they were born. They're the children of God because they're reborn. And you have to be born again to become a child of God. And so he is the God of Abraham, Yes, sure. 
But he's also the God of Isaac. Yeah, he is also the God of Jacob. And, and, and so he dealt with each one of them as if they had never dealt with that family before. And they, that's unique with God. God doesn't bless me altogether because my mother was a good person, but God blesses me because of my personal relationships with him. Now God will do the same for you. Uh, you, you, you can achieve things that your parents and your grandparents did not achieve. You can go further than they've gone in God because God is not dealing with you on their basis. God is dealing with you on your own, on your own basis. And this is what was taking place in this great dispensation called the dispensation of promise. And then we come from this man, Isaac, who was a, who was a quiet man, but a, a, a very persistent person. And uh, he knew how to do business. I said he became exceedingly rich. He didn't have to become rich. Abraham, his father, was exceedingly rich too, but he came, became richer. And, and so you have the story of Isaac. And then you come to Jacob. And you find a person here uh, that, uh, that was missing the way almost every time, cheating every time that he could, getting things that didn't belong to him, especially at that moment. And, and so here is a man that God had a promise to keep with him, you see. And finally, an angel came and wrestled with him all night long and says, I want to know who you are anyway. The angel, he knew who he was. He wanted to see if he was still Esau or not. No, he says, I'm Jacob, and that means supplanter. I, I'm the one that upsets everything. I'm the one that makes all the problems. I, I'm, 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 I'm the one that nobody ought to like. And, and he says, I'm going to change that. So God changed his name from being a supplanter over into Israel, a prince with God. So God made a change in him. This happened during this same dispensation because this dispensation started uh, with Abraham, went on through, through Isaac and, and, and Jacob. And I, in your teaching syllabus, it gives you the story of, of Jacob's sons uh, there and uh, their relationship. They lived under the same dispensation of promise. And it was uh, through Joseph that they were sustained and, and uh, the, the seed was preserved uh, because he obeyed God, walked with God, and, 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 and was God, uh, was God's servant uh, there in the land of Egypt. And so it worked all through there. Then it came down to Moses. Now we're getting close to the end of a dispensation in that, in that these people had no respect for God. They were now uh, 400 years in Egypt. And, and uh, they, they hadn't done what God wanted them to do at all. And God says, I'll have to change this whole thing. How did he do it? Out in the wilderness, he found a man named Moses who must have been seeking God, searching for God. And God spoke to this man, Moses, and told him, that, this is what I want you to do. Go set my people free. I want you to go and bring them out of that bondage. And so we see a lone man walking into Egypt uh, out of the desert. Long hair around his shoulders, tall, thin, fiery eyes, with a strong pace, 80 years young, walking into Egypt. You couldn't have guessed what was in his brain. That, that kind of thing still is today, you know. You couldn't imagine what was boiling inside of him. But I want you to know something. <laughs> Three or four weeks later, here he came back out. And now, now he, was, he, he was Pastor Moses. In those few weeks, he had, he had three million converts and three million church members, and all of them were rich. Would you like to have a church like that? They went and collected 400 years of salary that it was owed them, and they came out of there with gold till they couldn't walk straight, hanging around their necks, hanging onto their arms, their back, their back, had a big sack on it. It was full of all the treasures of Egypt. They devastated the whole country. And they walked out of there well paid for 400 years of slavery. And so here he came back out, not alone. You know, sometimes you can begin alone and you're not alone very long. <laughs> God begins to add something to you. And here was Moses. When he went back toward that desert, everybody was amazed. He walked in there alone and came back out with three million people following him. 
Not one of them sick. Would I ever like to pastor a church like that? Not one of them was sick. Not one of them was weak. They were all trumping at the bits to go places. And all of them had plenty of everything they needed on the face of this earth. What a, what a triumphal march it was. Even walked to the bottom of the Red Sea. They're the only humans that ever lived that knows what it looks like down there. Because God closed it back up again. Nobody's been back since. But what an amazing thing. Now, that was the beginning of the break off from one dispensation, moving over into a dispensation that we call the law. And that dispensation in our next lesson will be so imperative. It was one of the greatest dispensations. It's the one that the world remembers most about Moses, it, or, or about Israel, or maybe about the Bible, of those Ten Commandments. And here was a man who had a direct relationship with God in that he created a new people, he created a new nation, he created a new race, and he created the Ten Commandments. He created truth for the world to live by, not just his people. What an awesome situation this man brought into being. And he, 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 he crossed over making a new dispensation. And you and I are getting very close to that again today. We are in the very verge of creating a new dispensation, of leaving this dispensation called grace and to move into the dispensation called the kingdom of God, where Jesus shall be King of kings and Lord of lords. Hallelujah! And, and, and so we're at the same point, with a breaking point of something old being left behind, something new uh, uh, coming forth in, in these wonderful dispensations. Now, on, on page uh, 25, we give you the how Moses stood in front of the burning bush and God said, I've seen the afflictions of my people and I've heard their cry and by the, by the reason of their taskmasters and I know their sorrows. Aren't you glad God knows? You just don't want everyone to think he's not paying any attention. He's paying a lot of attention to every one of us. How many are glad for that? And then it lists the 10, the 10 plagues. Uh, I guess presuming you didn't, wouldn't be able to find them very quick. And then let's turn over to page 26. And this, and this God getting ready for a change of dispensations, he was going to, to have to move over into a new type of relationship with mankind, a new type of relationship. It is remarkable to me that God didn't give up. You know, man will give up, man will quit. But God don't give up. He just keeps working with a person. I've personally known of people that have gotten saved and backslid and gotten saved and backslid and gotten saved and backslid. You say, God, why don't you hit them? The Lord don't pay any attention to you because the next time he lands them, they stick. And God, God can see that there's something inside of you desiring him. And one day you'll have the fortitude and the strength to and hold it. And, and, and you won't go back on it. That, that was the situation I was in as a boy, you know. I'd go to a full gospel church and preach on the second coming of Jesus and, and they had all those horns and heads and, and, and dragons and, and man, I almost scare you to death, you know. And so I'd get saved every Sunday night. <laughs> of course, I lost it by Monday morning at nine o'clock. I'd already had two fights by then. And by Wednesday, I didn't have any of it left. But on Sunday night, I got it all over again because I was so scared of what that antichrist when they, when they had a statue that could talk, you know, and, 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 and boy, these Pentecostal preachers, they knew that better than they knew anything else. And that second coming of Jesus, and so I, I'd get saved. Now, now, I'm sure they got tired of seeing me come down the aisle. They said, that boy, he has to get it every time he comes to church. Well, he needed it every time he came to church, for sure. But, but uh, one day it stuck, you know. One day it stuck. And when it's stuck, it has never been moved since that time. So maybe, maybe God is dealing with people that you're not aware of, and maybe God's, God's doing things in their lives that you can't see, but God sees and God knows. Can you say amen? amen. And so we're now, uh, with, with the dispensational studies, moving to a point of, of, of change and a point of, of move over, and God will no longer work in that type of dispensation, 
But it does not mean that he has stopped making covenants. You know, we, we have lots of people, I mean, I guess millions of them. They say, now, if God is all that you say he is, why, why would he, would he permit a man like Samson to marry a heathen against the will of God, uh, to commit adultery with a harlot in Gaza, Gaza uh, to go and live with an awful reprobate like the woman that stole his strength from him? Why did he still have his strength? You see, because he was living under a covenant. He was a Nazarite. Until he broke that covenant, he was God's man whether he lived right or didn't. We have had preachers that didn't live right, and yet they had large churches or large evangelistic meetings where he says, well, listen, that man's not living right, and look at all these things that are happening. I just want to show you of a couple of things. One is, one day they'll, they'll step over the deadline. The devil will see to that. The devil will see to it that you'll step over the deadline and then you're going to lose everything. And the other is that they're under a, a covenant with God and God will refuse to break his covenant. He wished for you to break the covenant. God could have knocked Samson down and stomped him to death, but he didn't, you know. He still retained that power until one day he broke his covenant. And when he broke the Nazarite covenant, then he was, the Bible says he was like other men. You'll be the same. You break your covenant with God. There are men that in the trenches, in the war, said, my God, if I ever get home, I'll serve you. They haven't served God. They have not served God. They made a covenant with God. And they're going to find trouble, 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 sorrow, sorrow, sorrow. And everybody said, whoa, 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 why all of this? They have not kept their, their relationship with God. That they, they made it with God, and they didn't keep it with God. The Bible says it's better not to vow than to vow and not keep it. So if you've made a promise with God, sometimes we have said, oh Lord, I want to just tell you if you'll help me out of this mess, I'll pay my tithes. As soon as you got out of it, you forgot it and you didn't pay your tithes. God didn't forget it, that was just you. But you'll find yourself back in the same mess again, crying out to God, Lord, if you get me out of this mess. He said, I heard that before out of you. But you, you didn't change your way of living. And so God won't go back into a, a, another covenant with a person that breaks a covenant. If you're going to break the covenants of God, he's going to leave you by yourself. He, he, he's, he's, not going to, he's not going to just keep making covenants with a person that don't, that, don't, that don't keep his covenants. I have kept my promises with God. And I think every one of us should study ourselves and say, have we kept the promises that we made to God? And if we have, we're on the road to blessing. But if we have not, then we cannot be blessed. So the dispensation was one of trust in God, this dispensation. You'll have to write that down. I, 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 I always just keep making notes, you know. Uh, it, it was one of trust in God. Uh, you just had a feeling that, that, that if you and God... Uh, made a decision together uh, that God would keep his part, you see. And so it, 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 it is a matter of trust. And, and so we can sometimes make covenants with men. And God is looking on and he wants us to receive them. In Hebrews eleven thirteen, 13, it says that he received not the promises, but saw, the, saw them afar off and accepted them. Uh, sometimes God can tell you things and it's in a sweet relationship, but it's not for your lifetime, it's for another lifetime. You see, Smith Wigglesworth said, I see these things. I see the end of the world. I, I, I see the last great revival that will touch the earth, but says, I won't be there. So he knew it, he believed it, he had trust in it, but he wouldn't get there by himself. He wouldn't see it himself. But he says, you will see it. And, 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 and so I am looking for such a revival to move on the face of the earth such as the, the world has never seen before. And here was a man that believed it, accepted it, you see, was moving into it, uh, but he could not personally get there. You have to let God do what he wants to do in our lives. Uh, he, he, he is the potter and we are the clay. And the clay cannot speak to the potter and say, hey, I want my nose changed. The potter, well, potter will do his own work. And, and we are the clay. We will obey him or disobey him. And so I want to obey him. Can you say amen? So this was one of the great, the great times of life when men lived by personal relationships with God and, and 
personal promises of God. And we're sorry that it had to change. It changed over into severity, as we'll be teaching in our next, next lesson here, of how man was free, and God said, you won't accept it, so I'll put you under another one. I'll write it down where you have to read it. I'll nail it on the wall. You'll have to wear it on your arm. I'll be a different God to you now in that dispensation. And, uh, and so it we, we will be very exciting. So let's, let's prepare ourselves for it and understand that God wants to communicate. That's what these are all about. God wants to bless. And all he needs is for us to walk in what, we, what he is doing in a certain time. At this certain time, right now, we are at the termination, the terminal point of the sixth, of the sixth dispensation, or the sixth period of time that God dealt with man in a different manner. And let's prepare ourselves for the seventh one, when he shall reign King of kings and Lord of lords, and we shall reign with him. <laughs> Hallelujah!